All right, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here at Aloro Vineyard with David Namarnik. This is the first of our three interviews today. We're going to talk to David just himself right now. Uh, it's July 21st, 2016. And David, we're going to start with why wine? That's a great question, why wine? Um, you know, I originally got into the business um, making homemade wine in my garage. And if I go back to my teen years, I was always into, I was the one in the kitchen by my grandma. I had an Italian grandmother and uh, she was always cooking. And I was the one in the kitchen. My sisters were outside doing whatever. And I was in the kitchen. I always liked to learn how to cook and how to make things. Started making, fermenting things in my teen years. Whatever I could find that would ferment, I'd ferment it. Just kind of, a couple of buddies of mine, we kind of fool around with it. And then as I got older, I was making homemade wine in my garage. I had to call it my, uh, my little uh, garage winery. <laughs> And uh, following the Oregon industry, and uh, I've always been around farming and, and enjoyed farming and thought I'd want to farm someday. And those two passions kind of came together. All of a sudden the light bulb went on. I thought, you know, I'm going to buy some land. I'm going to grow grapes. And I'm going I'm to make some wine. And that was just, it just, all of a sudden, it was just like all of a sudden the light bulb went on. I had been working in a family business. I went through college. We're starting, we started the business when I was in my early years of college. Um, and I worked full time through college to kind of get things going. It was a produce distribution company. And so I was very busy. It was, you know, it was the old seven days a week starting a family business. Sure. Um, so when I finally had the time to focus on some other things in my life I wanted to do, those interests kind of came together and all of a sudden it just hit me. I knew I was going to buy some land and start farming grapes. And so you, the, the grapes seem to be your part of the, your passion of the project, the actual growing of the grapes. Yes. So yeah. how did you learn? Um, great question. Uh, really, uh, I would say self-taught, but really uh, reading books, uh, asking lots of advice. There's lots of, one thing about the Oregon industry that really, I really appreciated was how collaborative it is. Um, you can call another grower and ask them, hey, uh, what kind of rootstock are you using on what soil? Um, how is that working for you? What clones do you like? I called a lot of folks in the industry and asked them questions and um, worked with a few consultants. And you know, after a while, you gain knowledge. And uh, if you, and I think if you have a passion, you have an interest, and you have a drive, you're going to get good at something if you just if you put your energy into it. So um, for me, it was a, I love learning new things, and farming is an, is a great opportunity to learn something new. I mean, there's always something new to learn about growing grapes. So that's been fascinating. It's just been fascinating. I recently went to a terroir congress over at David Adelsheim's winery, and there was lots of you know scientist types there that were. Um, quite well, well above my knowledge level by, by, a, by a long time. But it was fascinating hearing from them and hearing what they had to say about our soil type and our geology and what makes this site the way it is. So love that kind of stuff. It's just fun. Lifelong project. I'll be sure. learning for the next how many years I'm in this. Sure. So have you developed a kind of grape growing philosophy? Yes. Um, I really believe that the um, overall health of the farm is directly related to the health of the vineyard. So uh, we're a live certified farm. It's a, an acronym for low input viticulture and enology. And I like that because it's, it's, uh, it's science based and it's all about the health of the soil and the health of the ecosystem on the farm. We try to uh, minimize the inputs. We try to um, use beneficial insects to keep pests in check. Uh, we leave natural areas, again, for, for biodiversity and, nat and again, to keep uh, things in balance, if you will, so we don't have to rely so much on harsh chemistry. Um, so, yeah, my philosophy about farming and about growing wine grapes is, is uh, the more you can do to enhance the health of the overall site, uh, the better off you're going to be. We also raise cattle and sheep on the property. Uh, we fertilize um, our hay fields with the manure from the, from the farm. It's kind of a complete system, if you will. Um, we, have a, you know, we, we grow a large vegetable garden on the farm. I kind of like, I think all those things kind of come together. We fertilize the garden with the manure, work it in, plant our gardens. It's, uh, to me, it's, it's, it's a, kind of a, a complete system that really uh, reinforces itself over time. My goal is, I always say, my goal is to have this farm, the soil and the ecosystem be better than when I found it. And so I think, and that is good for sustainability. It's good for the quality of the wine, which sure. is the ultimate goal, is to have, obviously, make wonderful wine that people can enjoy. Was being live certified something you set out to be, or was it something you kind of found as you were going through the process? It was something I found while I was going into the process. One of my customers was very um, uh, um, encouraging and said that I really should get involved in live. And uh, once I got online, looked at, looked at their materials, it was very easy to see why that was the case. Again, it's a, it's a great way to farm, and, and it's a great uh, way to, um, 
to, I think, farm in an effective way. Mm -hmm. uh, because, again, I like the science-based. One of the things, I, since you brought live up, one of the things I really like about live is that it is science-based. And sometimes uh, synthetic inputs are actually can be better than um, what I call organic inputs. And I'm, I, could, I was on the toe of going organic or live, and I mm -hmm. kind of thought, because the inputs aren't that much different. But in the end, I decided to go with live because sometimes I can put four ounces per acre on that won't harm beneficial insects. Whereas if I rely on um, a lot of sulfur, which is a, an, an organic compound, it does more harm to beneficial. So you can argue both ways because I know the synthetics probably have some things that maybe um, I'm not aware of. But, but overall, I tend to, I, I, overall, I, I think it's been a good methodology and it's worked well for me. What did they think about it when you were at the Terroir Congress? Was there a, what did they think about the live program? You know, they really didn't get into, um, you know, that issue. They really were talking more about the geology of the area and uh, the soils that we have. And I think the, uh, the goal was they were visiting different parts of the Willamette Valley. Mm -hmm. And so the idea behind that was to see these different AVAs, is the, do these soils make a difference in the wines? Is a, is a Jory soil going to have a different profile than a Willa Kenzi or a Shahila or a, a Laurelwood soil? So I think that was the goal behind that to kind of, and there was, there was, and there was also not just geologists there, um, there also were soil scientists, there also were other wine growers uh, from different parts of the world. So it was very interesting. But again, that's, that's kind of an Oregon type of a thing. And you see those types of things in Oregon and opportunities to learn and grow is, uh, is what makes it really satisfying. Sure. Yeah. So in addition to live, uh, what other organizations or events are you involved with? Um, well, we have participated in the INPC, um, and we find that a really uh, enjoyable event. It's, it's again, a, you see a lot of friends, you see a lot of customers, you see a lot of your um, associates in the industry. <laughs> so it's really a fun event. And then, of course, that salmon bake you guys put on at, at um, Linfield is, <laughs> that is kind of the key. That's kind of like the, the uh, I guess, the, the peak of the, uh, right. of the social the events. Legend, right. It's the <laughs> peak of the social events there, so uh, that makes for a really fun evening. But it's a very fun event. Other things, uh, the Shalem Mountain Wine Growers Association, the Oregon Wine Growers Association have their respective tastings we like to participate in. Um, there's been some tastings in Washington, D.C., again, sponsored by the Oregon Wine Growers Association we've participated in. So, um, you know, we're small, and there's only myself and Tom, and then David, my foreman, and of course Nancy does a tasting room. That's really the Aloro team. And so there's a lot to do for each of us. It mm -hmm. keeps us all pretty busy. So our ability to participate in a lot of things is really kind of limited because we are so small. Sure. But we do like to get involved where we can. So you, I noticed you called them associates in the industry. So I know that's one of the things that industry prides itself on is mm -hmm. kind of friendly competition. Yes. How, has that, how have you felt that as, as, as a newer part of the industry? You know, um, the thing that I think, again, I, I tell this to people from that are from, not from this area, I say, you know, Oregon's got a very collaborative culture, and I, and I use that word, I don't want to use that word loosely, it really is true. You can call up um, any, you can, almost, you can almost open a book of Oregon wine growers, pick a name, call that person up, and, and say you need some help, you have a question, or you'd like to ask them some advice, and I'd be willing to bet uh, 90 out of 100 times you're going to get a f wonderful response. <laughs> and I think that's a little unusual. Um, I think it's, I don't, I've heard that I can't say from personal experience, but I've heard other parts of the, uh, of the industry and other parts of the country can be a little more competitive and uh, maybe not as collaborative, but Oregon's wonderful that way. It's just, it's just, it's just a, it's a great industry and that really is what, uh, again, it makes it, it's part of the culture, it's part of what makes Oregon, Oregon. I think it's also helped the industry um, evolve so quickly as far as quality. Mm -hmm. I think Oregon knew they had to they had to, they were small, they had to be ultra premium quality, and that was gonna take collaboration and sharing because people were trying to figure it out early on. They were just trying to figure out, God, how do we figure this out? No one's grown wine grapes here before. Sure. So um, probably came about by necessity and has become kind of part of the culture. So speaking of grapes, um, you're sitting here in the vineyard. What are you growing here and what do you like to grow? Um, well, Pinot Noir primarily. We have 33 acres of grapes planted right now, and, and of those, most of it's Pinot Noir. We also grow some Chardonnay. Um, we have a little bit of Riesling and a small amount of Muscat we use for a late harvest uh, ice style wine. Mm -hmm. And so growing Pinot Noir it can be notoriously kind of tricky and you said you, <coughs> you were kind of learning on the, on the job so you, you did some background research on how to grow Pinot Noir. What did you find? Was it tr difficult for you? Did it take pretty quickly? Um, oh I think there's been some tough lessons. I, would, I'd, I'd be, I wouldn't be honest if I didn't say <laughs> that. but. Um, I didn't make any fatal mistakes, so, so that was good. I think 
the, more, the important decisions, such as the rootstock and the uh, type of Pinot clone you're going to grow, I think we made really good decisions there. Retrospectively, these vines have been in the ground now since 99, most of the vineyard, and uh, the original 20 acres, and since then we've planted, mm -hmm. you know, every few years another block. Um, I think those decisions were good. I think the rootstock we're using is a good match for the soil. I think that was a good choice. I think the clones were growing. We've gotten great feedback from winemakers besides, um, of course, our own wines. We get to see how those turn out. We also sell to a lot of other winemakers and that gives us great feedback as to uh, what they think of the fruit. So in that regard, I think we've made good decisions. Okay, okay that's all for I have for the first half here. Okay. Rich Schmidt, uh, I'm here with Tom Fitzpatrick, and they, now we're in the cellar. Uh, this is the second part of our three Oloro interviews today on July 21st, 2016. Tom, our first question for you is why wine? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, my experience with wine probably dates back to college as an undergrad back in the late 80s. Um, and I had a roommate that uh, grew up and lived in the Bay Area, and we were gonna, I was going to fly out. Um, we were going to school at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. Um, and I was going to fly out and we were going to drive his car back. And I flew out and I think that was the first time that I was introduced to wine and to fine wine anyway and the wine country and kind of fell in love with it. Um, you know, we joked on, on the few days that we were in Napa about the winery we would one day start. <laughs> and, uh, and then it was forgotten about. I went back to school. Um, a few years later, m who would become my wife and I moved out to Seattle and I was kind of reintroduced to both the, the wine industry in Washington and Oregon and, and brewing mm -hmm. and became a, a home brewer and then a home winemaker. Um, and I think um, there was an appeal, I think, of I've always been drawn to the outdoors in general. That's part of what brought me to, to Washington State, to Seattle. And I think just the idea of um, combining, I think what at the time was a hobby for me of, of making wine at home with, you know, kind of growing the outdoors um, and making something, I think was, was really the draw and kind of being able to combine all those things. Um, as well as the, I think the, the, the science side of things um, and the artistic side of things, I think. And I think um, I have a little bit of scientist and a little bit of artist in me, I think. <laughs> the perfect winemaking combination. Maybe. maybe. <laughs> so when you decided brewing and, and home brewing and home winemaking, did you, how did you learn? Yeah. Um, reading, honestly. Yeah. In fact, uh, the way that it happened with the brewing, um, my wife was an architect and we were just a few months we had been living in Seattle and went to a holiday party and a bunch of folks that she worked with were talking about brewing and they were going to be brewing the next weekend and so we left that evening and I went out and there was a little homebrew shop at the at Pike Place Market in <laughs> Seattle and I grabbed a, a homebrew book and um, some supplies and um, yeah just kind of ran with it yeah just a little bit of reading and a little bit of experimentation and um, same with the wine as well. It was the same. So it was uh, you know, just a, a combination of a little bit of reading and a little bit of experimentation. So when did you feel that you could adequately make wine? Like make wine that you could sell or give away happily? Yeah, that was probably after I started pursuing it professionally, I would say. I mean, you know, we made some nice wines at home, but um, I think, I think uh, you know, there was a point in time where I think, uh, and this was probably around the year 2000, I think I started thinking about wanting to pursue winemaking professionally probably in the late 90s. Um, I had thought about it before, but I got pretty serious. Um, in fact, I even applied to Davis, I think, in 1999 and was accepted and went down to register for classes and talk with a counselor and got cold feet and backed <laughs> out of the deal. Um, and it would be a couple years later that I um, went and helped a, a winery outside of Seattle for harvest. And, um, and that was kind of my la launching pad. That was my opportunity to try it out a little bit, kind of baby steps, rather than 
quitting the job, selling the house, and moving everybody down to California. This was kind of baby steps. Uh, so kind of get a little bit of experience. And, um, and so, um, yeah, I, uh, I had a good experience kind of with the small producer. And that was the impetus to um, sell the house, put our stuff in storage, <laughs> and my wife and I went to New Zealand. And, um, and yeah, I think it was kind of along this professional path that I got to a point where I think the wines that I was making were, um, yeah, wines that, you know, that I, was ha I would be happy with in the marketplace. Yeah, so yeah, it started with New Zealand. Um, uh, worked a harvest there, so I think we showed up there in February and um, left in um, June, and um, and decided to continue with it. So we moved from we flew in to Seattle and moved immediately down to Napa Valley and went to work for Pine Ridge Winery um, for a little bit, and then um, with Napa Wine Company, which is a a place where a lot of the Colt wines are made mm -hmm. down in Napa Valley. Mm -hmm. And, um, and kind of while I was working, applied for the, the grad program at UC Davis, so the master's program, and, and was accepted and, and then went to school at UC Davis. Um, this would have been, I think I started in 2004 at UC Davis. Um, went to school, uh, worked with a, a plat, plant biochemist uh, mm -hmm. for my research project, my master's thesis. Uh, it was a Pinot Noir project. Um, so I worked with Doug Adams, um, the Adams Lab. He developed a, 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 um, a phenolic assay for measuring um, yeah, phenolic compounds in both fruit and wines. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I had a, a thesis that I worked on, which was um, essentially I had about, I think I started with about 80 really diverse sites in California. and diverse from the standpoint of, uh, of environment. Really warm sites, really cold sites, you know, long growing seasons, short growing seasons, and basically was doing a bit of a survey to look at uh, the, the phenolic profile of Pinot Noir um, in the fruit, both in the skins and the seeds of the fruit at harvest, and, and then in the wines made from that fruit 120 days post press. And uh, to kind of, you know, take a look at you know, what we could see within that. So I had just four different clones on four different rootstocks that were included, mm -hmm. uh, a couple training, trailing, training pr uh, pruning trellis uh, methods, and, uh, and basically you know, analyzed this data and kind of were looking to see if there were um, drivers of phenolics from the standpoint of clone or rootstock. And, um, yeah, and actually it ended up being very environmentally driven. It's a really cool project. Yeah, no, it was kind of cool. And then from there, kind of wrapped up and went to France, went to Burgundy. And I worked for one of my favorite producers in Burgundy, uh, Domaine Hubert Lignier, um, who have holdings in um, Maurice Saint Denis, uh, Chambeau Moussigny, and Gevry Chambertin, um, some Grand Cru, Premier Cru, and village sites, um, and a great experience. Uh, basically a growing season, so starting in the vineyard with vineyard work up to harvest, working through the harvest, um, and then some pruning after. Um, so it was a good experience, and I think that kind of motivated us. We were, I think along the way, thinking about wanting to ultimately end up in Oregon from you know our time up in Seattle um, and having fallen in love with Pinot Noir from Oregon. Um, but we moved down to California. The weather, you know, <laughs> kind of sunny, pretty nice. I think we were wondering, well, I don't know, you know, should we, you know, do we want to reconsider? Um, and then I think we went to Burgundy, and I think both the profile of the wines, uh, the, the philosophy, the small uh, family orientation of the producers there really motivated us to want to come to Oregon. So we basically uh, came back. I finished writing my thesis, and we, um, yeah, I was looking for jobs up here, essentially. So you've been in Napa, and you've been in Oregon, and you've been in New Zealand, and you've been in Burgundy. So you have a pretty great perspective on sort of the, the, the main growing regions, or some of the biggest growing regions in the world. How does Oregon compare? Yeah, um, yeah, that's a great question. 
that's a complicated, <laughs> large answer question. But what I'll say is, um, I kind of feel like um, areas where you can successfully grow grapes um, each have their own unique characteristics that drive the general style and profile of the wines that can be made, you know, mm -hmm. from from that fruit. And um, you know, to me, Pinot Noir is is all about. I'll say subtlety, it's all about elegance, it's all about grace, um, it's about finesse, really. Um, you know, wine, wines that, um, you know, have good weight and, you know, beautiful texture, um, but aren't overly weighty, you know, that have good acidity, um, and, but aren't, you know, overly acidic or too flat. Um, uh, but I think in particular uh, about expression and the aromatic expressiveness of the variety and I kind of feel like in particularly warm environments um, you lose some of the bright acidity um, I think you um, in particular really lose the subtle aromatics and the subtleness and you lose some of that finesse and so I think Oregon um, has just the right climate to give you wines that have good richness and weight um, but retain the the expressiveness of it um, and uh, just overall good balance and good expression of Pinot Noir and so I would say like Burgundy um, and maybe some of the cool parts of of New Zealand um, but um, I think Oregon also has its own unique signature as well um, so even though I think like Burgundy, um, Oregon Pinot uh, shares an environment that allows for mm -hmm. that expression, um, that unique expression, those expressive aromas, um, the subtlety, elegance. Um, it's different and it's not the same and I would never say that our wines look like Burgundy because I really don't think they do. I think they have their own very unique and distinct signature. Um, although the profile of the wines are similar, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Do you have a winemaking philosophy and, and how is it, if so, I assume you do, yeah. how, how has it evolved over your time in the industry? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say that my philosophy, ha just in general, has evolved from when I started um, and maybe will continue to evolve. I would say, I would say, so my, my real interest is Pinot Noir. Um, and I would say I'm a I would say that I'm a terroirist, not to be confused with a terrorist. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, to me, ter you know, people define terroir in different ways, but to me, terroir is really the geology, the climate, and the culture. Meaning, I'll say the cultural practices um, of a vineyard. It's essentially, I'll say it's the 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 whole ecology of a vineyard site. Um, and my approach with wines is really to express that. Um, I kind of, I feel like each individual vineyard site is unique and has its own unique terroir. And my approach is to um, capture that in the bottle. So essentially, um, yeah, capture an expression of the personality of the site. And so I think that that really, dri that really drives what I do. Um, I would say I have a unique style approach and kind of a unique philosophy in, how I, uh, in what I think I need to do to achieve that. And I think at the, at the center of it is this idea of purity of fruit I always talk about. Um, and what I mean by that is um, there are a lot of things in the winemaking process that can get in, in the way, and it's not necessarily a negative or a positive, it's just a style choice, um, but that can detract from the, the characteristics of the site, that purity of the fruit that's, that's, uh, that's contained within those grapes. Um, so you could make decisions like to do whole cluster or, um, I don't know, to manage your cellar in a way where there's, there's more microbial influence. Um, and my focus is really to try to stay away from that and really focus on retaining the purity of the fruit 
um, that's encapsulated in, in the fruit. Um, and so my approach is, yeah, like a scenario um, where you have a vineyard that's a state where the fruit is very close, you know, to mm -hmm. where you're gonna mm -hmm. be bringing the fruit, um, where you can make, where you can really monitor kind of what's happening in the vineyard, um, where fruit's not sitting out in the sun for a day until you receive it, but rather is steps to the winery. Um, so it's kind of about preservation to some extent. Sure. Uh, preservation from when it's picked to when it gets to the winery, preservation through the process of winemaking, um, my wines see very little oxygen. Um, I top my barrels once a week rather than once every three or four weeks. Um, again, it's about kind of minimizing unwanted microbial activity in the cellar and really keep capturing and keeping that purity of fruit. And I will also say kind of philosophy wise, um, to me, a lot of the growing decisions are actually winemaking decisions. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's always very interesting because there's, there's this, I mean, growing is a big job in and of itself and, and wine production is also a big job. And so it's, it is easier to try to separate those and you're responsible for growing and you're gonna be responsible for sure. you know, what happens once that fruit arrives. But the, a lot of the decisions in the vineyard really drive and dictate uh, the profile of that fruit so much that to me they're winemaking decisions. So things like uh, the way the canopy is managed throughout the season um, in terms of, well, in terms of the, the trellis system, but also in terms of, you know, um, how you pull your leaves, um, as well as how, how the, uh, the ultimate crop load um, and how those vines are cropped all really drive the the profile of the fruit that you receive in the end. And to me, those are winemaking decisions. So for me, uh, my work starts early in the season in the vineyard sure. um, and trying to anticipate what the season has in store for us and, and what kinds of decisions that we need to make in the vineyard to achieve what we want to achieve. Um, I wish I could control mother nature, <laughs> but I can't. So I can't control, for instance, in a year like this, the amount of heat that those that, that those clusters will see, but I can modify the way we grow them in a way to um, mitigate the, the amount of heat that they'll see. Sure. Um, maybe by leaf co coverage, more leaf coverage um, in the fruit zone. Yeah. All right. Well, let's pause for now. That'll be the end of part two. I'm Rich Schmidt, it's July 21st, 2016. We're at Aloro Vineyard for the third part of our interview. Now we have David Namarnik and Tom Fitzpatrick together. And David, we're gonna start with you on this question, uh, which is, where, why Aloro? How did Aloro come to be? Um, Aloro, uh, great question. Um, I think earlier on we talked that I, all of a sudden this light bulb went on that right. I was I was gonna grow wine grapes and, uh, and make some wine. That was just these, this interest of mine in farming and, in wine just kind of came together the light bulb went on and when I had the wherewithal I decided to buy land um, I found the land I was looking um, up and down the Willamette Valley and and found this site and after it was uh, we I got um, some tests done to find out if it was a, a good site and it, it came back that yeah it's a great site for growing Pinot Noir I went ahead and purchased it and uh, started planting grapes that was in 1999 and then how did you two meet yeah, actually, so David, uh, in 2009, uh, yeah, the end of 2009 was looking for a winemaker. Um, I, I actually didn't hear about, about it. I don't even know if it was posted. I don't even think David posted the position, but I'm not sure. And I had been working for a gentleman here in the Valley, Eric Homaker, um, for about three years or so. And... I think I was feeling ready for the next step. I think he knew it. I think he was feeling I was ready kind of to move on. I was his associate winemaker. And it was the end of harvest, uh, a crazy harvest. It was kind of a crazy harvest. And I think, actually, I think his mother had passed away too. So I kind of I kind of stepped up a little bit um, to help out. And he, you know, at the end of harvest, he would always feel very generous. <laughs> well, this wasn't the first year either. 
And he actually mentioned the position to me. And I, and I would say one of the nicest things anyone's ever really professionally done for me. And he kind of just told me one day, you know, I know you're kind of ready. Um, I know of a really great spot and the guy's a super nice guy. And he said, if you want, I can, I can introduce you. And I was like, sure, you know. And then I thought he would forget about it and, sure, and that sure. would be it. Um, and actually I tried to contact David directly um, and just got a machine and thought, well, I'll, I'll try later. And then about an hour later, this was the day he told me, I get a phone call from David and he's inter interviewing for the position. He had, or, had been interviewing, he had some good candidates, but would be interested in meeting. And that, that was the introduction. Um, and I showed up to, to meet David a few days later for the first time. Let's elaborate a little bit on what Tom said. The, uh, um, when I'd heard about Tom, I had been interviewing, as he'd said, other candidates, and I had got a call from Eric Homaker, and he said, listen, he says, I know you're looking, you know, you've been interviewing, he says, but before you make your decision, he goes, you really got to talk to this guy. He goes, he's really good. He goes, uh, he goes, it, he says, I'm just going to say he's really good. <laughs> Talked to him, so that was it. So I gave Tom the call, and, uh, and here we are. And so how has the partnership sort of grown? How have you grown into the roles here? It's been great, yeah. Um, I think we get along really well. I think we have similar temperaments. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I think we have uh, different characteristics that balance well. I think we have a similar temperament. Um, but I think I'm very, I'm a very details guy, um, and very meticulous to the point of, um, at times, unless I have somebody more like him, a little <laughs> more big picture and, hey, we just need to do it, that sometimes things just won't get done. So I think we kind of balance each other. David, David's more likely to kind of say, ah, that looks great. Let's just go with it. And I'll be like, no, 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 wait, let's, let's look at it. We need to think about this. Let's. Let's always say, well, what do you think of this? Think about it. Let's, let's, we'll talk about it tomorrow. And David's more likely to call me and say, hey, what do you think about this? I think, let's just do it. <laughs> so I think, uh, yeah, I think very complimentary that way. Yeah, I, would, I would agree. No, I, I, think, I think we do play off each other well. I mentioned earlier, you know, there's a lot of collaboration that goes on during the growing season. And so it's really great. I mean, Tom is the winemaker is also a wine grower and so, we walk the vineyards together and talk about decisions we're going to make, all those little decisions during the course of the year that actually create the, sure. create the, 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 the vintage at the, at the end. Um, those are all little decisions that need to be made at the right time. And so being able to bounce it off each other really is beneficial. I think it really helps with the uh, overall quality of the wine we produce. So tell us a bit about Aloro itself. Uh, obviously, it's, it's amazing. It's a gorgeous facility here and gorgeous buildings you have. So where did the vision come from for the, the, the site? Um, well, the first thing was to find a good site because really Pino is all about site. So once I'd found a good site, you know, I had this vision in my head of kind of a Mediterranean, um, Mediterranean look to the buildings. My, my father was born overseas. Uh, we, have, we have relatives both in Croatia and Italy. And uh, going over as a child to visit relatives, um, the buildings looked like this. They were concrete buildings. They were built to last forever and they were very functional. And so that was kind of the inspiration. I thought, you know, someday I'm gonna I build a building. If I build a winery, it's gonna be a concrete building. It's gonna, it's gonna have a tile roof that's gonna last forever. And <laughs> so I like that idea of building something really well and, um, and, uh, and having it last. And I kind of, I like the look. I mean, like I say, if you're gonna walk outside and go to work every day to look at something pretty, this is not a bad thing. No. no. As aesthetics are important. They are. And I assume you're, you get the, that feedback from people who visit here. Oh, no, uh, you know, there's a couple of things that are really fun about this business. One is the people involved. There's some great people, but also having people come out, enjoy, you know, enjoy themselves, have a great time, and they come by and they look at the baby lambs in the spring when the lambs are born. They sometimes they bring their kids out, or they go in the taste room and they have a wonderful experience. I mean, that's really gratification. It's very validating to see people come out and enjoy themselves, and enjoy the, the wine we produce, enjoy the whole experience, enjoy how they're treated. Um, that's, that's, that's really enjoyable. That's very, for me, and I know, for, I think I'll speak for Tom too, I think, or I'll let him speak for himself, but I know that's part of the Aloro culture and it's kind of how we, um, it's kind of just how we, how we, um, how we do things here, I guess. Anything to add to that? Um, in terms of? Just how you feel about the site, the facility? Yeah. Uh, the, the yeah, no, culture. I think it's a pretty, a pretty special place. Um, I think it's a, I think from a, 
from a wine standpoint, it's a it's a very unique site. Um, uh, you know, the, I'm not sure how much was talked about the specifics of the site, but um, you know, we're sitting at about 650 feet here. Um, the bottom of the plantings on the site is about 450 <coughs> feet. Um, these are laurel wood soils, uh, so these are loess. Um, so uh, very specific soil. Um, the site's mostly west facing with some southern breaks. Um, and we're right above uh, creek drainage. Um, and I think it's, it, it's created kind of a pretty unique mesoclimate here. Um, I think that's very unique and really drives the personality of the wines that we make off the site. So I think in terms of the site, it's a pretty special, unique site. Um, and then in, in terms of the place, it's a pretty special place. It's, you know, we're, we're a small grower and a very small producer um, it's a very small team here. It's just David, me, and Nancy for the time being, plus David as our vineyard foreman. Of course, we get help in the vineyard and at harvest with, um, you know, the, a lot of the, you know, sure. concentration of work. Um, but it's a small team, um, and I think it's, it, has, it has a real kind of family feel to it, really. Um, there's a real warmth here, and, um, and of course, it's a beautiful place. And I think, it, you know, it's taken a while for people to discover Aloro, but I think when people do, uh, they just fall in love with it. Um, uh, even aside from the wines, uh, yeah, just the place, the space, the people, um, and as I'm sure David's mentioned, all of the other things that are going on on this site with uh, the animals and the other uh, things we're growing on the property. Was that part of a <clears throat> was that part of your original vision to have animals and herb garden and everything else, or was that something that kind of evolved as you had the property? I think it kind of evolved. Well, the cattle was my my daughter decided she wanted to do a 4-H project, and ended up being, I was trying to talk her into lambs because <laughs> we already had lambs here, and that is actually something my vineyard foreman started raising lambs. We kind of collaborated, and I provide the facilities, and he raises the lambs, and nice. and we have a nice supply of um, of um, of lambs to enjoy. Sure. The, the cattle, my daughter wanted to raise, um, as I mentioned, to a 4-H project, and she wanted to do cattle. So we're now we're raising registered Herefords, and we've got, got eight animals on the property now. We had three calves born this spring, so things kind of evolve. I've always grown a large garden, so that's just kind of something that's part of what we do. I can partially answer it, too, just as an outside observer. Um, I think David's passionate about growing things, mm -hmm. and it's not even specific to the grapes. Sure. If you come over during strawberry season, or he's as excited about the strawberries as he is yeah. about the about That's true. the grapes. Yeah. That's true. So true. I think there's just a passion for true. growing in general. But it's the right strawberry. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a hood strawberry sure. or a shucks, which are pretty good. But I'm, I'm particular to hoods. And you know, if you've had an Oregon strawberry peak a season, it doesn't get much better than that. Produce so, guy. So that, you know, you, you, if you're going to be a fruit grower, I think you really got to get excited about quality. It's just, it really, it's what rings your bell. So what does the motto, in wine we trust, mean to you? Yeah, I'm going to answer that because it's, is that, that's funny. Is that still there? That shouldn't even be there. But, um, so I'll tell you exactly what it is. Um, it, it, actually, I can't tell you. It's the password for something. Um, it was a password, and somehow it got into Carl's mind, and it somehow became our motto. But it's really not our motto. <laughs> That is an excellent answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so um, Tom, you also have your own label, is that right? You have I do. So my wife and I have a small vineyard in the Dundee Hills. Um, it's a vineyard that was planted uh, back in 1998 by Gary Andrews, um, okay. back when he was at Archery Summit. Um, it was called... What was the name of the vineyard originally? It was called Phantom Hill. And then when Gary left um, Archery Summit, he kept this little property. He renamed it and brought another partner in and called it the A&G Vineyard. And then that was, I think that was kind of the site around which he formed um, Gypsy Dancer, uh, okay. another label that he created. And then in 2008, um, my wife and I purchased this property from him and we renamed it Elevé Vineyard. And we um, just, you know, we moved into a little ranch house on the property, 
farm, farming the site ourselves, literally like the first number of years we were doing all the pruning cuts, I was doing all the tractor work and all the spraying and um, we were really doing as much of the physical work as we could and as of late we've had to kind of give some of that up but we st I still do a fair bit, I still do most of the tractor work, I have given up the spraying. Um, but we were just selling the fruit, um, Lynn Penner Ash was mm -hmm. buying most of it, Eric Homaker was buying a little piece of it and then starting in 2012 um, David allowed me to make a little bit of, of wine here and so I made um, you know about a hundred cases in 2012 and in 2013 a hundred cases and it ended up being closer to 300 cases um, not completely by design in 2014 uh, but it's very small production which I've been making here at Aloro um, and Elevé Wine Growers is the name of the label with Elevé Vineyard being the site that it's from and again the Elevé Wine Growers we talked earlier about yeah, this idea that, you know, a lot of those growing decisions are really, in my mind, winemaking decisions. Sure. And so it's kind of a focus on, um, on that, I think. So, like you both mentioned, Aloro, pretty small, pretty small. You're, you're, not, you're growing, a good amount of grapes, you're not making a lot of wine. Uh, small production. Is that the future of Aloro? Does it, you see it changing? Well, originally when the winery was designed, it was designed for 3,000 cases, and uh, that's about where we're at. And that's where we'll stay, to give you a, just a short answer. <laughs> um, you can only wrap your arms around so much, and um, uh, just, you know, just walking up and down the vineyard blocks uh, every week takes a lot of time. And uh, so I, I feel this size of a project feels really good. And I also think, uh, you know, just from a long-term uh, sustainability, for us, if we're going to get bigger, we need to add more staff, and it, you know it's got to be financially successful. And uh, like, like Tom had mentioned, it's Tom and I, and of course Nancy does a tasting room, and David is our is our foreman, and uh, that's a relatively small crew, and we can get it all done ourselves. But if we were to grow it, we need to bring more people on, and but you got to grow it a lot more if you're going to add another couple people, and it's um, it, it becomes a little different kind of a project. This I call this like a little art project. It's just really something that we can that we can do, that we can feel really proud of. And it feels comfortable, it feels, I, know, I hope it feels good to Tom, it feels good to me. And it feels like something we can enjoy and, and, uh, and focus um, our efforts on things we can really manage. Yeah, I agree. What about long-term? Do you have an uh, idea in place for family to join, success, succession plan, anything like that that you're thinking of at this point? Um, now, I got to be thinking my daughter's going to watch this someday, so I got to be careful what I say. But anyway, <laughs> that said, um, you know, I have a 17 year old daughter. She's a great kid. Um, she's been into 4 H and animals, and, and uh, she's a wonderful cook. She loves to cook, she's very artistic. And, uh, you know, of course, every father's dream is you have this vision for your child. Now, they're going to go off and do what they're going to do and become what they're going to become. But if she ever did want to get in the business, it'd be something I'd really encourage. But. That's a long ways off, probably, so we'll see what happens. Come back in 10 years and we'll sure. find out. <laughs> or maybe even 15 years. <laughs> we'll find, we'll find out then. Um, the general Oregon wine industry at large, uh, you've seen it change quite a bit. You've been since, uh, since the late 90s, early 2000. Uh, we're looking at 700 plus wineries now, 1,000 plus vineyards in the state. What do you see happening in the next 10, 20 years in the state? Mm, Both of you, I'd question. love to hear your answers. Yeah. Um, Boy, I, you know, the trajectory right now makes it look like it's just going to grow tremendously. Um, it's interesting, though, like, it wasn't too many years ago that Pinot Noir was, um, yeah, like a real specialized wine that, that a very small group um, were interested in and enjoyed, um, and, and something over, I would say, the last... Oh, I don't know, 10 to 15 years has really changed and it's, it's really come to the forefront. Um, so I, I guess I have questions of, you know, is the, is, is, will that continue? Um, uh, you know, I continue to see people that judge Pinot, you know, Pinot Noir based on the standards of other varieties in terms of, you know, darkness of color and, and structure and, weight and and ripe fruit and um, meaning those are the things they're interested in and and those are not the things that I, I th those are not the characteristics that I see in Pinot Noir although you can make a Pinot Noir that looks like that 
Um, so I don't know. I'm not sure if I, if I see, you know, see that continuing or growing, growing interest, or if it's a cycle and it'll fade a little bit. I'm not sure. Um, there certainly seems to be an interest in uh, folks from California that are struggling with issues around water, mm -hmm. issues around um, the high cost of real estate, um, with this looking really appealing and appealing maybe for Pinot Noir, but maybe just appealing in general, especially if we're, you know, we've, we've gone through a number of vintages that have been really quite warm. Um, sure. And so there's certainly an interest in, in growing grapes here and moving, moving pr production here. Um, most of that right now seems to be focused around Pinot Noir, but um, I don't know. Those are, I guess those are my, my impressions. So I, I figure if, if this wasn't a fad, you know, of Pinot Noir uh, being of interest and it's gonna, you know, fade away as we move kind of through the next generation, um, I think the potential for great Pinot Noir is great here. And I think it, um, it has a profile, it, it's, a, it's an environment that um, supports a profile of Pinot Noir, I think that um, a lot of people like, that I do in particular. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think if the, the market continues to support it, we'll continue to see more and more people move in, um, whether it's from abroad or from other states or just people in this state wanting to get in. Um, and yeah, I don't know, it just seems like the possibility for growth is tremendous. And if, if it is something that wanes over time, um, yeah, I don't know, you'll see people pull out. But I still think that there's gonna be a movement um, with land prices and water issues mm -hmm. in other states uh, moving into the area, it seems like whether that's Pinot Noir or something else. Yeah, I, I agree with what Tom said. I think, uh, I mean, uh, the popularity of Pinot Noir is in the last 50 years is just, I mean, this industry is 50 years old in this state, give or take. And from where it started to where it is now, it's amazing growth. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think, Oregon kind of punches above its weight for its size. I mean, the, our reputation, um, you know, I think uh, mm -hmm. among at least people that really pay attention, you know, that are really into, you know, uh, critiquing wines, I think we have a good reputation for, for the qual overall quality of the state and the wines we grow. So, and for the reasons Tom had mentioned, you know, the real estate issues in California, the water issues in California, even licensing issues in California, permitting and so on, I think that. Uh, you know, Oregon could have a really bright future. I mean, looking ahead another 50 years, where could we be? Um, so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very optimistic, but it, I guess time will tell. We talked, we talked in your interview, especially about the, the collaborative nature of the state's industry. And, and, we've, and we've, talked, we've done a lot of these interviews that we talked about earlier, uh, and we've had a lot of people kind of lamenting that shifting a little bit as the industry has gotten bigger. Do you see that if the, could the industry get big? Could it get big enough that that kind of becomes a thing of the past? Yeah, it's interesting. Like, so I've worked in some other, you know, states and countries, um, and I think professionally, um, there's always, my experience has been there's always been a friendliness around, you know, winemakers with other winemakers. There's always been collaboration. Um, like when I worked in Napa or when I was in New Zealand, I really felt like, you know, winemakers talk to each other, they're friends, they share things as much as they can, equipment. Uh, um, so I, I, I sort of feel as a winemaker, um, yeah, I think that'll continue. Um, you know, people, you know, people are eager for input and, and eager for um, camaraderie and mm -hmm. eager for uh, support um, and in need, in need of, in some cases. and. Um, uh, so I, th I think that that'll be the case um, outside of kind of uh, professional relationships. Um, I don't know. I guess as you get bigger, it's 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 harder to be a small community, you know. So not everybody will know everybody, mm -hmm. and um, I think when you're really small, it's a small community. And I think maybe the roots of Oregon are, um, and I often think about this uh, because I come here and we have lots of resources. We have Oregon Vineyard Supply. Mm -hmm. We have agronomists on staff there to chat with. Um, you know, you have uh, vineyard management companies that can help you uh, in a pinch or help you farm your site. But this was a small group of people that showed up here with no resources, fending for themselves. 
And I think part of that early collaboration was that it had to be that way. They were relying on each other for support and help because it, it was, there was n none other out there. Mm -hmm. So it was a tiny community and it's grown and grown. And I think it's held that kind of collaborative feel. Um, and, but as it grows bigger and bigger, it's no longer a small community, and it'll, at some point it'll become hard for everybody to know each other and for, um, and for it to be quite like it was at the very beginning. But I think it's, I don't know, I, I don't feel it's an industry necessarily um, where people really feel necessarily like they're competing against each other necessarily for market share, at least not you know, with the size of this industry at this point. And, um, and I think people feel like there's more strength in numbers and there's more to be gained by having a density mm -hmm. of producers from this region um, working together to tell the world about it. And so I don't think in the, in the foreseeable future that that sense of collaboration and wanting to work together will change. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would agree. I would agree. I think that uh, it is getting bigger. There's some, you know, some larger companies coming up and buying vineyard land and uh, you know some of the larger California players but uh, overall it still has a very collaborative feel to it and uh, I, don't, I don't see it changing anytime in the near future and I think even with the with the big players as they move in uh, the companies are big um, but they're being run by individuals um, mm -hmm. that are put in, in the key positions to run them. And some of, some of those individuals are local people that everybody mm -hmm. knows and, um, and or are maybe new people that um, seem to be fitting into the community just fine, um, at least so far, it seems like. Okay. Um, what advice would you guys have for someone looking to enter the industry today? Don't do it. <laughs> um, it's a it's a tough business. I'm not going to lie. Um, I it's a it's a great business, especially if you have a passion for wine. Um, I love the annual cycle of the business. Um, you know, we're not like a brewery or a distillery where we're distilling 24/7 throughout the year. Um, we make wine once a year at harvest. We bring that fruit in. We have one chance. We bring it in, we do our thing, and within a month or two, it's it's put put to bed, and um, it is uh, yeah, it's it's elevage, it's um, it's it's you know uh, evolving in barrel, and we move on to do other things that we do that changes kind of throughout the year, and then a year later we'll kind of start that annual cycle. That's pretty cool, um, especially if you like variety. Um, I think that. There's a lot of, I mean, people are in this business, business it seems, because they're passionate about it. And, um, and I think because of that, it draws people that are passionate and, and interested and engaged. And so I think that the people in the industry are great. Um, you know, we're making something. And we're making something from, from something that we grow, you know, from the soil. And that's pretty cool. Um, that all said, um, there are a lot of wines in the world. And mm. there are a lot of wines in Oregon. There are a lot of wines in the world. And it's a, it's a tough business selling wine. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and um, yeah, it's, you know, <laughs> so uh, it's not a business where you come in and you, you live the, the, the wine life and you make it and, you know, you ship it off and go on vacation. It's, it, you, you make it and then and then it, and then the tough part starts really. Um, that's kind of my take on it. So um, I guess I guess the bottom line is uh, it's a beautiful business, but it's a terrible business. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of my. It's a terrible business to be in. It makes no business sense. That's well, kind of my perspective. Well, I, I, I think um, I concur with. Tom's, you know, I mean, the reality check is it is, it is, they call it farm work for a reason. It's, it's a lot of work to, uh, to maintain a vineyard, a lot of expense. Um, um, it's a lifestyle business. I think if I'm going to talk about the positive attributes about it, you need to have a passion for it. I, people have asked me that question, gee, I want to plant some grapes, what do you think? And I'll say, well, what do you like to do? What rings your bell? What makes you happy? You really have to like growing things and making things. And uh, we're really, we're making a product where it's coming out of the dirt. You're nurturing it all season long, then you get one shot a year to make this wine. And every vintage is going to be unique because of all the variables involved and during, during the course of growing the grape. So 
Um, it has to be something you really, you're passionate about. There's always been better ways to make a living than growing grapes in Oregon, always. Going back 50 years ago, and it's that way now. Um, it's probably more competitive now because there's so many more wineries. Um, there was a time when, you know, if you just put it in a bottle, it's sold. There was, hmm. there was a time in, in the industry, in this, in this state, and then we had to realize we have to go out and really market our wines because there's a lot more competition and there's, um, and there's, um, there's a business aspect to this, like Tom had mentioned, it's hard selling wine. So I think like any business, if you have a passion for it and you really think you can, you can, um, you've got a good, great site and you can make some great wine, it's all, it's all what your, what your goals are in life. I mean, I, I would, I mean, I, I've just been fascinated with it and see my, 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 my life for the next 20 years is gonna be pretty fun. But, um, but that said, it's a lot of work and, it, and you really have to, uh, have to understand that it's gonna take a lot of investment, it's gonna take a lot of time, a lot of effort. And um, that being said, um, you can create some success if you're realistic about it. <laughs> it's not gonna be easy, but if you're realistic about it, it's a great, it's a, it's a lifestyle business. So you brought up one of our running themes in these interviews, which is selling wine and how it's the kind of the bane of every winemaker and mm -hmm. owner's existence, al almost everyone. Mm -hmm. So how do you go about doing it? Well, we have a tasting room on site and we really didn't have a, a full-time tasting room. I used to be on the tractor and somebody would show up and want to buy a case of wine. I'd hop off the tractor and spend a half hour, an hour with them. They'd buy some wine, they'd leave and eventually we opened a tasting room and, and now we've improved it and now it's a, it's a, it's a very comfortable tasting room that people really frequent quite a bit so it's been great for our sales so we sell a lot of our wines on site here which has really been very helpful and of course you grow your club of members that buy wine every year and build these long-term relationships that really is is, is great because um, that's you know selling, selling direct to the consumer is, that's really your best way to sell and then of course we have distribution across the country we're in how many states now Tom about 20 about 20 states we're in so then we have our wholesale distribution which is the other way we sell it and of course there's relationships you have to build with those distributors mm -hmm. and kind of the conundrum is for a small person like ourselves is how do you maintain those relationships with the distributor in New York or in Atlanta or in Texas or wherever the case and uh, and make that pencil out because the airfare is not cheap hotel isn't cheap and when you're small like Aloro and you're selling an ultra premium brand, which by its nature is not gonna be the high volume, let's say sure. a wine that's at a lower price point that's, made, you know, that's gonna sell it in a much, um, in a much more um, higher volume. It's hard to amortize those travel costs. So we've talked about that. How do we, how do we, and we've come up with some ways that have helped us move the wine. And, uh, and, and frankly, you know, I think the, we've made some really nice wines here and I think it's helped sell the wine. But um, the tasting has definitely been a key part of what we're doing and then the direct sales to our, our club members, if you will, or people that call you up and say, hey, ship me a case of wine to get online or, or whatever the case might be. One of the things we found with, uh, with selling the wines is that one of the benefits of being outside of the area, you know, going distribution to other states, is that folks may go to a restaurant and have a bottle of wine and they say, boy, I really like that. And then they'll get online, find out where we are, and either call us or email us and sure. want to buy some wine. So that, there's a benefit to that. So sometimes when we look at the cost of making a trip out to, a, say, a, a East Coast market, um, we look at that and we go, well, you know, but we do benefit. There, there's a long, is a long-term strategy sure. about, okay, and hopefully, hopefully we're making the right decisions and we are investing our money the right way to, to make the sale successful because in the end, it's a business. And if we don't sell the wine, everything stops. So we do need to sell the wine. That's an important part, and important, and it's a difficult challenge. Yeah, I, I mean, my my feeling is operating and distribution has been extremely challenging for small producers yeah. like us. And I have kind of a theory. I don't know if you have time for it or not. No place but, to be. <laughs> but I have this theory, just kind of through observation, with Aloro, combined a little bit with some of my experiences with trying to self-distribute my own small Elevate wine growers label, and that is. So Aloro, um, although um, maybe in Oregon is a brand that's um, recognized, um, I would say outside of the state, there are a yeah. lot of brands, even some that we think of as being highly recognized that aren't. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and if they are by the buyers or the retailers, they're often not by the consumer that's looking to buy. Um, and, and my feeling is, is with a small producer, um, that has that's that's doesn't have high recognition as a brand, um, and you have a distributor in a market. Um, 
you know, they're going to go out and they're going to call on and pour your wines for some of their customers. And my sense is, is that, you know, the way that wine buying works, if I'm a restaurant buyer often, um, sometimes with retail buyers, but, you know, you have limited shelf space, you have limited space on your list, and you might taste a wine and say, I really like this. I've never heard of this producer, but I think it's a really nice wine. Um, I might entertain bringing it in, um, but I don't have space now. Um, so check back with me. And so, you know, you, you walk, your, your distributor walks out the door, and as soon as they're walking out, another distributor, of course, is walking in with somebody else's wine, and they say, this is a nice <laughs> wine, you know? And so the name of the game is really follow-up. And, um, and what I've come to the conclusion is, is that the way that it works is you need, to you need to keep following up until you're following up on the day that they're looking to replace yep. that spot. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's profitable for a distributor to do that for a small producer. Meaning if it takes 20 times, I, I, I think a distributor will follow up two, three, maybe four times. And then after that, it's forgotten about with that customer. Sure. And I don't think that's enough. And I think that's why us small producers are struggling with distribution. Um, I don't think it's profitable for a distributor <clears throat> to follow up 20, 30 times with one retailer. Sure. I don't know if it's profitable for anybody to, <laughs> um, but that's the way that it works. And that's the way I think that you build a brand. And so my, my sense in the national markets is if you, if you want to be in a particular state um, and you want that to work, I think you as the, as the winery need to do that work yourself. And unless you're a big enough winery, I'm not sure you have the resources to do that. You need to be big enough to have a national sales manager that can do some of that yes. heavy lifting for you. So, and that's, so that's, that's what makes it tricky, I think, for a small producer like us in, in distribution. But you guys have been very successful then, I mean, getting into that many states. Yeah, we're in those states now. The second yeah. question is how, how much wine are we selling in each of those states? Exactly. That's the question. Yeah. Exactly. In fact, we've really, um, I mean, we have a, f a few distributors have done a really good job for us, but there's quite a few that really, when I mean, you're in those states, but are we moving much wine? No. Yeah. And we figure, well, as long as they, we don't, we can't afford to invest any time because there's not a volume there. But we've had some that have actually surprised us and done a very good job for us. So it's, it's, um, it's part of the challenge. Yeah. All right. Well, that's all the questions I have. Does anybody have a question they'd like to get in? Anything we should have asked that you'd like to talk about? Any last thoughts? Um, I don't know. You guys asked a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, I think we've kind of we've kind of shared a lot. But this has been a fun experience. Yeah. We appreciate you coming out. Thank and, you. Uh, thank, thank you for thank your you. time. We really appreciate this. Yeah. Thank you.